I'm gonna start the recording now while we while I wait. Is anything not making sense? Is there any questions about the flow of the class or any of the lecture that we've already gone over? We did, yes. If I'm not mistaken. Let me give me a second. I'll verify that. I'm pretty sure we did because I don't. There are some chapters that we don't do um, and won't bother with. So, yeah, we did. We went from 11 to 14, then hit 13 just because it flows better that way. Um, and now we're going to continue on with 15 and 15 on up. Yes, um, so we will touch on shock a lot actually. Uh, as we go through medical emergencies. We're going to talk about the different types of medically induced shocks. When we go to trauma, we're going to talk about trauma induced shock. Um, so you guys will be masters of it by the time, especially because we're going to give you a lot of stuff at the boot camp as well. Um, that's why we skipped the actual chapter. Any other questions? We good? Yeah, yeah, no, you guys is in at the EMT level, you're gonna have a lot of stuff on shock as well. So um, yeah, us skipping it, and not really hitting on it too much on that actual chapter is not because we're not going to go over it in the class. It's just because I want to break it down a little bit more in depth and a little bit more in the context of how you're going to see it in the field. So instead of just doing a shock chapter and then not really touching on it anymore, I'm going to actually talk about shock when we get into different things like um, bleeding, for example or allergic reactions. And we're gonna talk about the different kinds of shock that you may come across in those situations. So you'll learn about anaphylaxis when we talk about allergic reactions, you'll learn about hypovolemic when we talk about bleeding, um, that kind of thing. So we can actually focus on those particular th kinds of shock. If we, did, if we did just a blanket shock chapter, um, I think a lot of good information gets lost. So I just chose not to do it that way. But all right, so tonight we're going to be doing uh, respiratory emergencies. So let me get everything going here. All right, here we go. This is going to be a lot of the calls you get. Um, that's why they put it early on in the medical chapters. So you know, if you've ran a lot of calls or if you've ever been in EMS for a while at any level, trouble breathing is a very vague, very broad term, but it's when you're going to hear a lot. Um, patients suffer from this. The technical term for it is dyspnea, as you can see on the slide. So shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. And a lot of times that's all you get when dispatch tells you something. So when we do the scenarios, that's how we're going to do it. I'm going to tell you, you've got a patient with trouble breathing and that's all you know. Um, so I want you to start trying to think about what causes these things. And on top of that, I really want, and this is how I'm gonna try to structure this in the class, we'll see how it works, but to make it easier, make you guys more functional as EMTs, I'm not just gonna teach you, here's your breathing, your respiratory emergencies and here's your assessment. And now you know how to do the assessment, but what drives it? Um, we have, and I've, I've touched on it in another chapter, we have different things that we will do. So like there's going to be certain interventions that you can do for respiratory emergencies, certain interventions you can do for cardiac emergencies and everything. And when you come up to your patient, I don't want, I want you to absolutely master your assessments. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I need to memorize. I need them, you to be able to say them in your sleep, but I don't want that to be all you got. All right. As an EMR, sure, that's that's your bread and butter is 
asking the questions and there's really not a lot of interventions that you can do but when you get emt and above you start to get a toolbox of things that you can do to help your patient and so that's what i want to be clicking through your head when you're doing these scenarios when you go and do this in the real world somebody tells you that they're short of breath i don't want your first thought to be okay well let's see sample what's sample you know that kind of thing i want you to think about all right Trouble breathing, what treatments am I going to need to give to make somebody not have trouble breathing? Um, once you think about those, once you get that in your head of, all right, here's what I'm going to do to fix you based on what I see you've got. Um, you use your assessment to make sure you can do those interventions. So as we go through this class, I'm going to be teaching you guys basically like a, a basic level protocol that may or may not be how your agency does it, but it'll be, everything will be in your scope. And then you'll take that when you go to actually work at your departments, wherever you are, your, your ambulance company, you will be that aggressive EMT that is, you know, all right, I know how to fix you. Now I'm gonna use my assessment to make sure I'm safe, to make sure I've got everything I need, and to make sure that I can do these interventions for you and that your, your vitals will support it and stuff like that. And that's the really the purpose of the assessment. Um, we, we beat it into you guys so hard that a lot of times it gets lost that, you know, your job is more than just BSI scene safety. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Anyway, trouble breathing can be caused by many different conditions. So we have the common cold, uh, coronavirus, obviously the common cold is Corona and we have a, a nice little version of it going around right now, but asthma, heart failure and pulmonary embolism. Can anybody tell me why heart failure? is one of the um, reasons for difficulty breathing. Other than, you know, if your heart's not beating, you're dead. So what's what would be the cause of, uh, or how, how would heart failure cause you to have trouble breathing? Fluid overload is usually how it winds up being yes. Um, because if the blood's not flowing, then it's gonna start to seep into the lungs. Any other Any other input? Remember, we talked about the two systems working hand in hand, right? If the cardiac system fails, the respiratory system will fail and, they, or, and vice versa. If respiratory goes and cardiac will go. Um, the, the way that our um, gas exchange happens at the capillary beds, if the blood doesn't flow, then the gas exchange doesn't happen. Um, and yeah, it starts to cause that whole cascade effect. So if the blood's not flowing, um, then when you take a breath, if the oxygen is sitting around the capillary, around the alveoli is already, I'm oh, sorry, if the blood's already oxygenated, then oxygen in the capillaries from your next breath is not gonna do anything. So the blood has to be moving and they have to kind of be in sync with each other. Um, if things fall out of sync, then we have problems. Eventually, yes, you're gonna run into the issues where like heart failure means, um, Fluid is going to start to seep into the lungs. Now you're going to have fluid in the lungs. Um, Megan, you said cardiac output decreases. That's, I mean, it's right. It's not wrong um, because your heart's not beating properly. So sometimes the cause can be a little difficult to determine. Several different problems may contribute to the patient's dyspnea at the same time. That can really kind of throw you for some loops because when you start dealing with older patients who have a lot of chronic illnesses and everything, you may be saying, well, you know, trouble breathing, this is probably it, but it's compounded by that. This by itself may not have been any big deal, but together you have bigger problems. And then you run into the problem of how do you treat it? Because sometimes um, the treatments, the one problem stops you from doing the treatments for another problem. You may want to give a certain medication, for example, but you can't because something else is going on. Um, and that's where, like I was saying earlier, your, your assessment comes into play. All right, so a quick anatomy recap. If y'all notice in your curriculum, and I've got it up on Canvas for you to look at, it tells you what we're going to do every night, um, especially in these chapters. You will find where I, I'm not, I don't expect you to read the whole chapter. All right. Um, and I also have in there that says, like, you know, go back and review chapter six, which is your anatomy chapter. And I'll give a page range that pertains so that you're only looking at the anatomy that pertains to this particular chapter. Uh, but we're going to go over a quick anatomy review again, just so that we can talk about 
that's fresh in your mind when we're talking about what's going on with somebody where they have a hard time breathing. So the respiratory system consists of all structures that contribute to breathing. This includes the diaphragm, which is your main muscle for breathing, your chest wall muscles, accessory muscles, which are typically around the neck and like your clavicles, and excuse me, nerves from the brain and spinal cord to those muscles to actually control them. Your upper airway consists of all anatomic structures above the vocal cords. So again, and this is where you get to play. As EMTs, y'all get you get to do everything that goes wrong above the cords. So your nose and mouth, your jaw, oral cavity, which is where the, uh, kind of like the back of the mouth, where the nasal ca cavity and the oral cavity are the same thing. Your pharynx and your larynx, um, your larynx is where your, your playground stops. Anything past that is going to be a paramedic that's doing things. The principal function of the lungs is respiration. So again, you know, remember the difference between ventilation and respiration. This is where it starts to matter when we start talking about things in this chapter. Ventilation is a physical movement of air in and out of the lungs. Respiration is the gas exchange at the alveolar level. So if I take a breath and expand my lungs, air moving into those lungs is ventilation. And then as you can see at this bottom picture where the capillary bed um, covers all the alveoli, the broccoli looking stuff, that's respiration. That's where the actual gas exchange happens, where you breathe out the carbon dioxide and you put oxygen into the cells. So your lower airway, um, that's your bronchi. You have two of them, your bronchioles, which get smaller from there, and then those go into your alveoli. For your physiology of respiration, there's two processes that occur during respiration. You have your inspiration, which is your air coming in. Expiration is air going out. And again, um, you're breathing in normal air and you're breathing out CO2. Doesn't necessarily mean that every bit of the air that comes out of your mouth is CO2, because again, remember all that dead space, the air that's in your, your trachea, your, um, your bronchioles, your bronchi, all that stuff is air that is not being used. There's no gas exchange, so it's going to come out the same way it went in. Oxygen is provided to the blood and carbon dioxide is removed from it. And this happens very, very fast because it's a um, it's a pressure the way that it works. So pretty much as fast as it hits the alveoli, that's it. There's no real weight at that point. These are just some pictures to kind of show you how it works. So as the blood flows through the capillaries, they um, they make the gas exchange with the alveoli. And I want to point out something, too, while we're on this, because we're going to talk about COPD in a little bit and emphysema. But if you look at these bron these alveoli, they kind of look like broccoli, right? And if you and it really does a good job if you're looking at how the capillaries sit around them, there's a lot of surface area because these bulbs are very defined, very definite, and very separated. And you get the capillary bed that kind of goes around between them and all over them. They're mostly balls. So you have a lot of a lot of connections there for gas exchange to happen. Um, we're gonna talk about later on when things start to mess up in that area and what that will do to your patient. All right, so the big thing on this slide that I wanna point out is that the brainstem senses the blood's carbon dioxide levels. That's what triggers us to breathe. Most of what we do for breathing is a buffer to keep our pH balance in check. Our normal body pH balance of our blood is 7.4. Um, to give it a range that paramedics look at is 7.35 to 7.45. You don't necessarily have to know those numbers, but my point being is that as we build up carbon dioxide in our bodies, that number starts to drop, right? Carbon dioxide is um, acidic. So if you think about the pH scale, where seven is water, that's that's right in the middle. Everything under seven is an acid. Everything over seven is a base. We typically hang out just a little bit on the alkali side. Not very far, but, you know, like I said, 7.4 is, is the target number. Um, we have sensors all in our body that detect the carbon dioxide levels, and they report to the brainstem. The brainstem says, all right, carbon dioxide is getting a little high. We're getting acidic. We're getting acidic, so we need to increase our breathing. And then what that does is it causes you to dispel your carbon dioxide by breathing out and then replace it with oxygen. And that's going to be important um, later on in this chapter. So we're going to talk more about that. A 
Okay, so for patho, um, anything, anytime you ever see pathophysiology, we're talking about the effects of something going wrong on the body. So the proper exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide can be hindered by abnormal or pathologic conditions in the anatomy of the airway. So if something goes wrong with the actual airway, say that um, you something gets in there like a piece of steak, right? That's not necessarily an anatomical difference, but it is a physical difference in your airway now. Um, swelling is an example. So if you have a burn victim, they breathed in some heated gas and it, it scorches their airway, they're gonna start to have a swelling up that narrows their passages. Um, those are the kind of things that we're dealing with there. Disease processes, so COPD, emphysema, asthma, and then pulmonary vessels, which may have abnormalities that interfere with blood flow. So again, um, this is where these two systems kind of come into play. If there's a problem with the vessels or a problem with the blood flow, there may not be any problem with your respiratory system, but because the cardiac system is having some issues somewhere along the line, it can mess with your ability to breathe. You as an EMT should recognize the signs and symptoms of inadequate breathing. You should be able to do this from across the room and it really isn't hard, especially when your patient's freaking out and they're in the tripod position and they're talking in two to three word sentences telling you to fix them because they can't breathe. Um, so the outward signs can be pretty, pretty easy to see. In fact, let me ask you this, because we've mentioned it before. What is the first sign that somebody is having trouble breathing. I'll give you a hint, it's not hypoxia or um, um, blue skin and all that. Yeah, there you go. They're agitated. First thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna start to get anxious um, because the brain is the biggest baby in the body. The very minute something starts to go wrong, it's gonna be the first one to pipe up. So if it loses sugar, the brain, the, the alert status is gonna be compromise. Same thing with oxygen. Carbon dioxide retention and hypoxic drive. Um, patients will sometimes have an elevated level of carbon dioxide in their arterial blood. This is usually caused because exhaling has been impaired for whatever reason or the blood flow is not necessarily there. Um, the body may naturally produce too much carbon dioxide. Sometimes that does happen. So when it does, usually the body is going to, again, it's, it's a buffer system. The rate that we breathe at and the depth has to do with our ability to keep those carbon dioxide levels in check. If your levels stay high for a long time, which is what happens when you have like COPD or um, specifically emphysema, the respiratory center in the brain may not function properly. Basically, we just oversaturate and we kill those those receptors that are trying to detect carbon dioxide, if, it all, if they always stay saturated, um, they're just, the body's just gonna stop using them because it doesn't make sense anymore. They're just saying, you know, too high, too high, too high. They kind of burn out. Um, so when we normally, are, are the normal process for us breathing is a carbonic drive. We, it's a CO2 that tells us to breathe. When those um, receptors start to burn out, then the body switches to its backup, which is called the hypoxic drive, if anybody's ever heard of that. So because it can't, it's no longer looking at how high is the carbon dioxide. Now it's looking at how low is the oxygen. So when the oxygen gets to a certain point, the body is triggered to breathe. That's why, um, and we'll talk about it again. If you have a COPD patient, sometimes they tell you not to bring their O2 levels too high because it'll trigger, it'll it'll shut down their um their automatic sense and automatic urges to breathe. They'll actually shut their airway or shut their respiratory drive down. And it's because their sensors are saying, oh, cool, we got plenty of oxygen now. We don't have to breathe. Um, it doesn't mean you should withhold oxygen from them, but you may want to titrate it down and keep them at a, you know, more like a 94% range instead of bringing them up to 90, 99 or whatever. Um, and then if you are going to give oxygen to those patients, watch them very closely because if they do decide to stop breathing on you, you want to catch that fast. So for causes of dyspnea, dyspnea can be caused by any, well, I won't say any, but it can be caused by a lot of medical conditions. Uh, if the brain is deprived of oxygen, it's usually the first thing to pipe up, like we said a little while ago. Altered mental status may be a sign that the brain is dysfunctional because of severe hypoxia. It's not always that, it could be sugar, but if you're dealing with a patient with trouble breathing, usually they're going to be amped up 
they're going to amp up first, like, oh my God, I can't breathe. And then as their oxygen starts to deplete further or they just go longer in that hypoxic state, then they're going to start to get sleepy and drowsy and then kind of pass out on you. Patients often have difficulty breathing or hypoxia with the following medical conditions. You can see them here on your slide. You have pulmonary edema, a fever, pleural effusion, obstruction of the airway. So, you know, maybe chew your steak all the way before you swallow it. Hyperventilation syndrome, um, which is where they're just breathing too fast. You see that with people freaking out. What they're doing is they're dropping their CO2 levels too low, right? So we don't want that to happen. Um, environmental or industrial exposure, carbon monoxide poisoning, and drug overdose. And carbon monoxide poisoning, um, I try not to get on the soapbox of that as much, but um, keep in mind that stuff is cumulative. Once it binds to your hemoglobin, it takes a long time for you to kick it. And that's why it can, you know, it has no smell. All it'll do is make you sleepy. You'll probably get a little sick from it. You could throw up. It just depends. But if you're already asleep, um, it'll just put you further and further out until you don't wake up anymore. Be aware that one or more of the following situations may exist in the dyspneic patient. All right, Gas exchange between the alveoli and pulmonary circulation can be obstructed um, by fluid in the lungs. That can be like what's what what's a good reason or what's a common reason that somebody might have fluid in their lungs? Any of you guys that are, that that already work in the medical field or have been on calls, pneumonia can do it. Yep. The thing about pneumonia, typically you're only going to get fluid in, in in the area that has the pneumonia in it. Pneumonia is not a um at least not unless it's like really really bad and they're ate up with it, but um. Pneumonia typically sits in a certain portion of the lung. Um, it's just a bacterial growth, usually because an infection managed to get all the way down into the lungs. Anybody think of anything else that can cause a lot of fluid in the lungs? Think beyond respiratory. Think cardiac. Any of those kind of issues, too. Yep, CHF, there you go. So um, COPD doesn't really put um, fluid in the lungs, but CHF definitely does. When the heart is getting compressed for whatever reason to the point where it can't beat properly, it stops the blood flow. The reason why congestive heart failure is much more of a respiratory emergency is because once that blood stops moving, it's just going to kind of seep through the capillaries and into the on top of the alveoli and into the lungs. And the problem is, is once those alveoli get wet um, from fluid, they can't really exchange the gas properly anymore. So our goal is to use positive pressure to put that fluid back in their bloodstream. If they're awake, we can use uh, CPAP. If they're not, if they're already losing consciousness, then we typically just bag them with the BVM. But our goal is to create pressure in the lungs, which is that fluid back. Angina, um, and well, angina technically just means chest pain. Um, so by itself, not necessarily, but depending on what's causing it, could lead to having some fluid in the lungs. Good question. COPD and emphysema cause CHF. Um, not normally, no, those are strictly respiratory issues. Usually what causes CHF, and we'll get into that more in the cardiac chapter, um, is some kind of fluid buildup around in either in the pericardial sac or um you could have the problem if you get air into the chest or any kind of basically anything starts to put pressure on the heart to where the heart doesn't have the room it needs to beat properly um alcoholics like severe alcoholism can lead to it um different different a couple different disease processes can lead to it but usually it's just a restriction of the heart's ability to beat. All right, anyway, moving on. No problem. So um, airway passages are obstructed by muscle spasm, mucus, so infections, you know, weakened floppy airway walls. You have, if you've ever looked at your, like look closely at your airway in pictures, kidney failure causes it also. Yeah, yeah, because then you get too much fluid in the, in the body. It's got to go somewhere. But um, 
if you've ever paid attention and looked at the actual uh, structure of your airway on paper or whatever in an anatomy book, the the airway has these concentric rings of cartilage around it, right? And then they're C-shaped, except for one, one's all the way around, but they're mostly, they, they're like the letter C. They have a little break in them. Um, but that provides structure to your airway so that if you take a breath, you don't collapse your airway. That makes it rigid. So all you firefighters in the house, it's just like your heart suction if you're going to draft from a pond or something like that. That's how your airway is built, so that the hose doesn't collapse every time you try, try to take a breath. Um, if those cartilage weaken for whatever reason, or if you have a congenital issue where they don't form properly, you take a breath, your airway collapses. Basically, it's just going to, every time you try to take a breath, it's going to close off and you can't get any air in. The, uh, I see the pleural space is filled with air or excess fluid. So we already talked about that. The lungs can't properly expand if there's too much junk in the chest. It doesn't need to be there. So trauma can cause that bleeding into the chest cavity. Besides shortness of breath, the patient with dyspnea may also report chest tightment, tightness or um, air hunger, which is where it's almost like they just they just can't get enough of it. They're, they're struggling to breathe. Um, again, when it starts to get down to those last agonal breaths, it may look like they're trying to bite the air in front of them, almost like they think it's solid. This is common with cardiopulmonary diseases. So again, you know, CHF being your your big one. Um, Pulmonary edema is another one. This is a condition associated with congestive heart failure. So you're going to see this, that fluid in the, the um, lungs. Severe pain can cause a patient to experience rapid, shallow breathing without the presence of a primary pulmonary dysfunction. So think about this. All right. Pain is a big deal. Somebody calls you and everybody's pain threshold is different. You know, we all I, I jokingly say that everybody's pain is always a 10 on the pain scale, even if it's just a stubbed toe. But pain will make, especially if it's pain in the chest, if it hurts to breathe, like really hurts to breathe, you're not going to want to take a big breath. Your patient's not going to want to take a big breath. They're going to be breathing shallow to try not to get that pain. So if they have pleurisy, for example, or um, some kind of traumatic hit to the chest, um, and it hurts them to take a deep breath, they're not going to take a deep breath. So what they're going to do is, is they're going to wind up breathing faster because they're breathing more shallow. Um, but the problem with that is that they start to blow off too much carbon dioxide. And again, that causes more issues. So we try not to let them do that. We have, The best thing that we can do is try to relieve their pain so that they can start taking bigger breaths. And some patients breathing deep causes pain. Like I was saying, because it causes expansion of the chest wall. When they have pleurisy and that chest wall expands, um, there is a little bit of rubbing from the lungs and the chest wall, the, the chest cavity, because it's the expansion of the lungs is pushing the chest wall. Normally, you don't feel that um, because we have this pleural fluid that keeps everything nice and slick and it moves easy. There's no friction. But if there ever becomes a dry spot, then every time you take a breath, you're going to, it's almost like, um, it's almost like rubbing, like getting those carpet burns um, either on your knees or on your hands or whatever, and then it hurts to touch or it hurts to move. That's kind of what's happening there. All right. Um, upper or lower airway infection. Infectious diseases causing dyspnea may affect all parts of your airway. A lot of times they start in the upper and then they move down. Some can cause mild discomfort. Some require aggressive respiratory support. It just depends on what it is and how bad it is. So we're going to talk about a couple. All right. Croup is one. This is inflammation and swelling of the pharynx, larynx, and trachea. So it is typically seen in kids. This isn't something that we get as adults, at least not normally. Um, and it passes like it's, it's spread like crazy around kids. So like if one kid gets it and goes to school, a lot of the kids in this class are going to have it. So this is something that you'll hear about going around, right? Um, you really don't, I don't know. I mean, in today's world, I guess, because kids aren't going to a classroom. But usually if you're in a system and um, one kid gets croup, you're going to you're gonna probably wind up hearing or responding to a lot of kids getting croup. Hallmark signs of this are strider and a seal bark cough. So when they cough, it almost sounds like a seal. I'm not going to make the sound effect because it sounds like, I'm, I'm, it sounds stupid when I do it, but uh, usually if you give them humidified oxygen, um, 
they'll this will clear up. No, I ain't doing it. <laughs> you can't make me. Um, a lot of times the reason their cough sounds the way it does is because their dry their airway is really really dry. So give them humidified oxygen, and a lot of times it will it will help clear it up a little bit. Nope. Oh no. Mm -mm. <laughs> Can't make me. I need a lot of alcohol for that. All right. Epiglottitis. Um, there's another one. This inflammation of the epiglottis, right? It's in the name. Did I skip a slide? It is skip a slide. My bad. $50. Oh, man. Y'all going to get me in trouble. We are being recorded. <laughs> anyway, epiglottitis is an inflammation of the epiglottis. Uh, this usually is a result of a bacterial infection. And the problem with this is, again, is if it doesn't get treated, it's going to go somewhere. It's going to keep spreading, usually down into the lungs. I'll tell you what, I'll take $100, but not in this class. Um, more predominant in children, but this can also occur in adults. A big sign of this is that they're going to start to drool. When the epiglottis swells, it causes the salivary glands to kick into overdrive. So um, you're going to see them having a lot of drool. They may have a very sore throat, high fever. And they usually, because they're having a hard time breathing with this epiglottis being swollen up, you'll find them in a tripod position. That's just the person's general position of comfort when they're having a hard time breathing. Treat children gently and try not to make them cry, because what do you do when you cry? Typically, you start hyperventilating, gasping, all these things, um, and it can cause some major problems. So we want to try to keep them calm, reassure them. I and mean, we should be doing this with kids anyway because they have the whole stranger danger complex, which is great, but they're going to see you as a stranger, um, and it can get in the way of you doing your job. So get them in a position of comfort, give them some high-flow oxygen, and don't put anything in their mouths. They're at a higher risk of, of choking. All right, RSV, respiratory syncytial, I don't know if I can say that right, syncytial, something. Anyway, RSV. <laughs> um, RSV is common cause of illness in young children. This is an infection in the lungs and breathing passages, so basically this is a lower airway. This is highly contagious, um, and at this point, especially if it's something that they've had that has progressed to this, you're going to see them, a lot of times you're going to see signs of dehydration. So just treat the airway and breathing as appropriate. We're going to give them humidified oxygen, um, you know, bag them if you need to, but hopefully they're not having any real problems with their lungs. Bronchiolitis. Somebody tell me what that is. Based on the name. Inflammation of the bronchioles. There we go. All right. Um, this is usually a progression from RSV, as it goes, as it continues down your airway, your bronchioles will start to swell. And this usually affects newborns and toddlers. Your bronchioles become inflamed, hence the name. They'll swell and they'll fill with mucus. Your body already produces mucus um, in your airway. That's a normal thing, and that happens to cause turbulence when you breathe your air so that it warms up to your body temperature by the time it gets to your bloodstream, even if it's six degrees outside. Um, you have this problem you start to get more to the point where it becomes an issue um you get so much mucus that it starts to it starts to weigh down and it, and it just kind of drains down it also closes off the airway because again remember this is newborns and toddlers their airways are very very small to begin with um, so all this extra mucus can actually cause problems with them being able to breathe pneumonia this is usually the end all of respiratory issues. This is, you're down in the lungs at this point. Um, this is a progression that we usually try not to get. If you ever heard somebody say, if you don't get this respiratory issue treated, it's going to lead to pneumonia. Um, that's, you know, we just, it's, it's bad juju. Um, this is a general term that refers to any infection in the lungs. There's walking pneumonia. There's just regular pneumonia. It's more of a blanket term. But it's often a secondary infection that begins because something in the upper respiratory tract descended down. It never got treated. Um, you know, people are like, oh, it's just my sinuses and I don't want to go to the doctor. I'm going to keep taking Allegra or whatever. And this infection continues to spread. 
Um, this can be caused by a virus or a bacteria or even by a chemical injury or direct lung injury. Bacterial, bacterial pneumonia will come on quickly and result in a high fever, uh, whereas a viral pneumonia is a little bit more gradual and less severe. The problem with viral pneumonia is you can't treat it. We just treat the symptoms till it goes away. But a bacterial infection, um, you have to go to the doctor and get antibiotics for it. Pneumonia especially affects people who are chronically ill or terminally ill. So elderly patients are going to have chances of pneumonia. In fact, you may wind up coming across patients who know they have pneumonia and they just live with it. Um, because elderly patients are such at a high risk for it, they may be taking an antibiotic that keeps it in check but never really gets rid of it. Signs and symptoms for pneumonia. Let me go back to that slide. Rapid or labored breathing in children, blue or gray lips or fingernails. So again, they're hypoxic because that wherever that pneumonia is at, you're not getting very good gas exchange in that in that part of the lung. So the more area that gets ate up with pneumonia, the worse it is. Fever, dry skin, decreased skin turgor. Um, usually because they're getting dehydrated. Exertional dyspnea, so it really doesn't take much for them to get out of breath. A productive cough, because of all the mucus, obviously. Chest discomfort and pain, headache, nausea and vomiting, and even musculoskeletal pain. So it kind of sounds like the flu, if you think about it. Um, you can get weight loss, confusion, because you're not wanting to eat. Your breath, your your Hypoxic levels are going to cause your brain to start to mess up and diminished breath sounds. That's the big thing. So you as an EMT, if you are going to be treating a patient that might have pneumonia, make sure you should be getting breath sounds on all your patients anyway, but do a really thorough breath sounds um, auscultation whenever you're doing that part of your assessment. Don't just do, you know, top, top, bottom, bottom. Maybe listen on the sides, that kind of thing. If you can figure out where the pneumonia is in the lungs or how much of it is in the lungs, um, that's information that the doctors at the hospital can really find useful. And also, the more of it, obviously, that you find, the more you can expect that you're going to have to struggle. You're going to have a struggle keeping their oxygen levels high. All right, pertussis, this is your uh, whooping cough. This is basically, it's going to be a kid. It sounds like he's getting slapped in the back every time he takes a cough or every time he coughs. This is an airborne bacterial infection that mostly affects children younger than six. Why is it that all this stuff seems to affect children younger than six? Anybody know um, what is go what what is up with kids at that age statistically? Their immune system. So what about that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, they do have one, but it's just not that great. It's not developed. When you're when you're a firstborn, you have your mom's immune system. Um, so a lot of times infants are going to be pretty resistant to things. But by the time they become toddlers, that, that immune carryover is gone and they're relying on their own. Um, and it usually sucks for the first few years of life. I know I stayed sick as a kid. Um, I stayed sick to the point where when my when my immune system developed, I never I don't get sick anymore. Um, but that's pretty much it, right? Um, as your immune system builds up, you typically are immune to it. This is highly contagious and it's passed through a droplet infection. So if kids cough on each other, just like I mean, we're all familiar with that now from um, coronavirus. If you're within six feet of somebody and they cough in your direction, those droplets can get on you and, and in you, and now you've got it. Um, patients will be feverish and exhibit a whoop sound after a coughing attack. So basically, every, like I said, every time they cough, it sounds like they're being slapped in the back at the same time. It almost sounds like a percussive thing. Um, and then watch for dehydration and suction. Their airway is needed so that they keep a clear airway. That's going to be, you're going to find that your treatment for almost all of this stuff is the same. So don't worry, you don't have to be masters of pertussis versus, you know, the um, pneumonia or any of that. This is all kind of an awareness thing. Um, we just want you to know what it is and know how you're treated. Mostly it's just maintain the airway, give them oxygen. Some things you're going to be able to do more, and especially your paramedic will be able to do more. But um, 
most of your treatments as EMTs is going to be oxygen. They have a good airway. Um, epi, if you if depending on what it is, albuterol depending on what it is, and then get them to the hospital. Influenza type A. Uh, this is an animal respiratory disease that is mutated to infect humans. In 2009, we got hit with H1N1. If you all remember that, that was shortly. That was actually shortly after I joined the military. Um, it's also called the swine flu. It became a pandemic, which means that it got basically every continent got hit with it. Symptoms included fever, cough, sore throat, muscle aches, headache, and fatigue. And if you get this, because it is still out there, this could lead to pneumonia or dehydration. TB. This is every every uh, medical person's nightmare because it's so so contagious. TB is a bacterial infection that most commonly affects the lungs. It also can be found in almost any other organ, um, not just the lungs, but that's where we most likely find it. It can remain inactive for years before producing any symptoms. Patients often complain of fever, coughing, fatigue, night sweats, and weight loss. With severe infection, patient, the patient will experience shortness of breath, coughing, productive sputum, bloody sputum, and chest pain. Um, this stuff is very, very, very contagious. So you notice that it says at a minimum, you're going to wear an N95 respirator. You almost have to treat these people like a damn hazmat scene. So like when they, if you're bringing one in, um, put an N95 on your patient, put an N95 on you, notify the hospital ahead of time. They need to know that you're bringing a TB patient in so that you don't just walk them right through the ER with TB um, exploding everywhere. What they'll do most of your ERs have a uh, negative pressure room so that air outside the room is always flowing into the room rather than out of it. And then they'll put the patient in there. That way, TB being in the air, it never comes out of the room because it's already in the low pressure side. It's not going to go uphill. And that works out better for the patient as well as the uh, the, the hospital staff. All right, acute pulmonary edema. This is where the heart muscle can't circulate blood properly, so um, fluid, basically your, pla your blood plasma starts to get loose into the lungs. The left side of the heart cannot remove blood from the lung as fast as the right side delivers it, uh, so you get that backup. Basically, as, as the right side keeps pushing more and more blood into your pulmonary system, your, your pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, that pressure starts to push the blood through the capillaries and into the lung space. This is usually the result of, of CHF, like we were talking about earlier. So the only real way to fix that is to create more pressure in the lungs to, again, make everything goes path to least resistance. So if you can build up pressure in the lungs, it will push that fluid back into the bloodstream where it belongs. It doesn't fix congestive heart failure, but it does fix the pulmonary edema. And you can hopefully keep your patient alive long enough to get them to a hospital where they can do something a little bit more definitive to fix the CHF itself. Usually if somebody has got this, it's because they have a longstanding history of chronic CHF um, that they kept under control with medication, but for whatever reason, either the meds stopped working or more likely they just didn't take it. Not all patients with pulmonary edema have a heart disease. Sometimes this is trauma um, or because they inhaled like toxic fumes or something of that sort. So just because you see this, don't immediately jump on CHF, but just know that this is common with CHF. It's just a picture for your um, pulmonary edema. All right, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a blanket term. This is not a specific disease in itself. So emphysema patients are COPD patients. Asthma patients are COPD patients. COPD, it just means a long-term, something is obstructing your airway for whatever reason. Uh, this is a slow process of dilation and disruption of airways and alveoli caused by chronic bronchial obstruction. COPD is an umbrella term, like I said. Um, it includes emphysema, bronchitis, especially long-term chronic bronchitis, maybe the result of direct lung and airway damage from repeated infections smoking um like long-term smokers will get this because they they get emphysema tobacco smoke is a bronchial irritant and in just long-term 
long-term irritation will cause this. Um, with bronchitis, excessive mucus is constantly produced, obstructing small airway and alveoli. And if the um, airways are weakened as the lungs, protective devices are destroyed. So again, you know, that, that mucus starts to disrupt things. Um, eventually, you will start to lose surface mass or surface area of your alveoli. So those nice bulbous bro uh, broccoli looking things They'll start to lose surface mass. Those bulbs will start to flatten out and combine, and then it it really gets to a point where instead of having a bunch of little bulbs with um, capillaries all over them, your whole alveoli head becomes just one big ball, much less surface area, which means much less um, capillary contact, means much less areas where you can have that gas exchange. So again, without without having all those spots to get the uh, CO2 out, now your CO2 levels are going to start to rise. You're not getting that good of a, an exchange with every breath. So certain things are going to happen. Isn't this also caused by TT syndrome? I was about to say, I, you're going to you can educate me on that one. I don't know what TT is. What is that? Is that um, that's not that's new to me? Inflammatory disorder caused by swelling of cartilage. So okay, so you're talking about the cartilage around your your trachea. Of the chest wall itself, mainly in kids. Because in full grown adults, we typically don't have a lot of cartilage in our in our chest wall. We've pretty much solidified it all into bone. I'm going to tell you what, um, I'm going to look that one up. That's going to be my own homework for the night. And then I'll get back with you all on it because I haven't heard of that. That's interesting. So remind me um, on Thursday. I'm going to look at it tonight, but remind me on Thursday and I'll bring it up and we'll talk about it. Checkmate. <laughs> all right. Um, chronic oxygenation problems can also lead to right heart failure and fluid retention. So again, you know, the area, the respiratory system and the cardiac system go hand in hand. You do start to get pneumonia pretty easily with COPD, um, especially if you start getting fluid in the lungs. That fluid is like, think of it like stagnant water. The more it sits there, the more it's going to start to grow bacteria, especially if you start breathing in any kind of bad air or something, or if there's something in the air that you would normally just breathe it right back out and it's not a big deal, but because you have fluid in the lungs or um, you're just otherwise unable to get air out as easily as you can get it in, sometimes that stuff will be able to take hold and then you get stuck with things like pneumonia. Repeated episodes of irritation and pneumonia can cause scarring in the lung and some dilation of the obstructed alveoli, which is what leads to your COPD. Emphysema is the most common, mainly because we get that uh, as, you know, from smokers. Um, you have less, le less elastic material in the lungs and this can also lead to um or i'm sorry this can also be caused by inflamed airways not just smoking most patients with copd have elements of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema and there's a couple other signs that we'll talk about too that you may see has anybody ever heard of a barrel chest or a club fingers that kind of thing all right so yes long long-term copd um can start to cause actual physical changes i guess is what we'll call it um a barrel chest so look if you if you can picture um the average person's chest that caves in between the two pec muscles right when you go down to the bone um a barrel chest is where everything just kind of flattens out and expands it makes it look like one big rounded chest there's no definition between left side and right side like you would normally see um and then also because of the the blood flow issues and everything we get what's called club fingers where our fingers get kind of fat and flat at the end um so those are some things that you can see if somebody has had copd for years you're going to see that stuff and it's, it's it's pretty pretty wicked actually i've come across it a few times All right, so here's an example of the alveoli. If you look um, on the far left here, 
your alveoli is pretty pretty bulbous, but as it as it gets inflamed, as they start to progress through that COPD issue, um, you'll notice that the bulbs start to kind of expand out. And because they do that, these expanded areas start to close off some of the some of those gaps between them. You have less surface area and with that means less capillary connections to get those oxygen and carbon dioxide gases to switch. Wrong way. Patients with pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the lungs, will have wet lung sounds, which is kind of common sense, but um, you will actually hear it. It'll sound like they have liquid kind of dripping around in their lungs. Patients with COPD, however, will have a dry lung sound. Um, COPD is not a fluid buildup. COPD is more like a barren wasteland. Um, you can easily confuse this with congestive heart failure if you hear the wet sounds, but um, that's because congestive heart failure typically will lead to a pulmonary edema. But like I said, I don't want you guys to get so wrapped up that every time you see an edema, you immediately jump on congestive heart failure. It's not always the case. There's other, other signs and symptoms when we get to the actual cardiology chapter and talk about congestive heart failure there. We'll get into more of what's what that um, what signs and symptoms are of that beyond the respiratory system, so that you can you can recognize it more more clearly. All right, five more minutes. We'll take a break. We're actually making pretty good time. Asthma, hay fever, and anaphylaxis. So now we're going to start getting into some other issues that cause um, COPD and like allergic reaction stuff. So asthma, hay fever, and anaphylaxis result from an allergic reaction to an inhaled, ingested, or injected substance. In some cases, we really don't know what it is. There's just some unidentifiable allergen has triggered the immune system. So we'll start with asthma. As you can see in the picture, um, asthma is basically a bronchospasm. It causes the bronchioles to suddenly clamp down your patient's going to have a hard time breathing and it's going to kind of create a whistling wheezing sound as the air gets sucked through those narrow passages approximately 25 million people have asthma just in our country and it affects all ages but you really see it more in kids typically five years to 17 years of age this produces a characteristic wheezing sound um your patient if they are not used to it or if they're young or even if they've had it for years. I mean, it's it's never fun to not be able to breathe. So you're gonna see them really kind of freaking out when an asthma attack happens, their anxiety is gonna go through the roof. The wheezing can be so loud, you don't even need a stethoscope to hear it. Just standing in front of them, you're gonna hear it. In other cases, the airways can become so blocked that no airway is, no air movement is heard at all. And that's a major problem. So if you, let's think about this, um, like I was saying, let's think about this from a, an assessment and a treatment standpoint. If somebody has asthma, and think of it just, just as it basically is where you're breathing through a small airway, what do we want to do? What's our ultimate goal? What do we want to do to the airway? Open the airway. We want to, we want to make it, we want to go from that, that straw back to the garden hose, right? So can anybody think of a medication that we give that will open an airway. And we'll talk more about it later. I'm not going to leave you guys out to dry, but I want to see if anybody gets it. Albuterol, right? That's what's in most inhalers. So when a um when an asthma patient has an air has an asthma attack, they breathe their inhaler. Now here's an issue. Let me ask you this. What if your patient is completely shut off? Their air their asthma attack is so bad they can't breathe, which means they can't get the albuterol into their airway very well. Okay, so let's say that um, there's no paramedic on the scene. OPA is a good idea. The only thing about an OPA is it just keeps the tongue off the back of the airway. So when you're dealing with an asthma patient, um, the problem is deeper down. Humidified oxygen is great, but if they can't breathe, you're not going to get it into them. 
So the question, Wesley, was um, we typically give albuterol to asthma patients, but if what what if their airway is completely shut? And Tamara got it. So epi. All right. Now, a lot of times when we think about epi, we think about the paramedic either giving it to them in an IV or um, some other kind of push. But is there anything you can think about or think of that you might have in your bag that would deliver epi? The, okay, yeah, you got it, epi pin. So it's we typically use that for allergic reactions, right? Um, a lot of times your patient, if, if your patient has allergies, they'll have an epi pin, but we're not talking about allergies right now, we're talking about asthma. We carry epi pins in our bags mostly. Um, if your patient is sitting there with a complete airway block because of an asthma attack, it's not it's not a piece of steak. It's not something you can do the Heimlich maneuver over and and, and clear the airway. And you know that as that you know they have asthma, they have their inhaler, but if they can't breathe, it doesn't do them any good. If you pop them with an EpiPen, it only works for a couple of minutes, but that's really all you need. As soon as they start to get some air in, hit them with their asthma um, albuterol inhaler and then now you've got their actual medicine into them hopefully between the two you get their airway back um that's just something to think about because sometimes those those asthma attacks get so bad that they get a complete shut off and then they can't their inhaler is useless because they can't breathe all right moving on to hay fever um this is usually like a spring, it's, it's hay fever, think hay in a field, um, springtime allergies. So hay fever causes cold-like symptoms, including a runny nose, sneezing, congestion, and sinus pressure. Symptoms are caused by an allergic reaction, usually to the outdoor stuff like pollen, dust mites, pet dander, that kind of thing will cause this. Patients with hay fever tend to be atopic, and meaning that they are more likely to have other allergies. So you don't get hay fever with if typically you don't um without having some kind of other allergy to trigger it spontaneous pneumothorax it, i'm sorry you know what it's seven o'clock take a break i don't want to keep going while we because this is a lot of information so 10 minute break be back at 7 10 and we will continue on
All right, I'm back. Um, <clears throat> Wesley, I looked up that syndrome you were talking about just to kind of get more information on it. And I can see where it would have, yeah, you would probably have some trouble breathing. Um, if you, especially if you're taking deep breaths because of the way that the chest expands and where that syndrome, let me actually pull it back up so I can talk about this. Um, a little bit of a tangent, but it was a fantastic question. This is something that's not normally covered because it's not widespread. This is a rare disease um, and it usually goes away on its own. So uh, tights, teats, however you want to say it, tight syndrome is basically a swelling of the cartilage in the top four ribs um, because of the way that our chest is connected, the way our rib cage is connected to the sternum and then where it connects and, and lifts that section doesn't really move too much when you take a breath however um you can still technically feel some pain there as it gets worse you'll start to feel some pain going into your arms you know it starts to spread out even though the problem is not getting bigger it's just that deferred pain so when you're asking your question if this is somebody that you're dealing with um depending on the severity of it they may tell you that the pain is actually starting to radiate down their arms is it could be the the inflammation can be in any one of the four ribs um and usually it goes away even though the inflammation the swelling may still be there for months the pain itself typically may shouldn't last that long hey congratulations <laughs> that's good to know um so the, that hurricane wasn't too bad i hope or at least everybody was already in the area but um yeah so the pain the pain is usually going to be there regardless of whether or not they take a deep breath. But according to the article that I was reading on it, um, you may see where like, you know, sneezing, um, exercise, that kind of thing can start to inflame, can start to rile up the pain a little bit. Um, but most of the time, docs usually just give you an inset, like a leave or something. And then that's that's how you treat it. You just treat the pain until it goes away. Um, it doesn't look like there's, I didn't see anything that said it was something that would make somebody call 911, but you may show up. That's something that somebody, somebody might have on top of something that they called 911 for. So that being said, you may, that may add symptoms to something and kind of throw you off. I guess you could say, you know, cause we, we hope that we don't get more than one sickness at a time, but usually it doesn't work that way. Um, anyway, so let me get back to the to the lecture. So let's talk about spontaneous pneumothorax. This is a couple of med terms I want you guys to know. Pneumothorax means air in the in the chest cavity, right? Pneumo meaning air, thorax is your chest. So if I were to say tension pneumothorax, now I'm referring to air and fluid. All right, and then hemothorax would just be blood. Those are your the, the different ways you're going to hear these kind of things talked about. Tension pneumo is both. Then you have pneumo, which is just air, and hemo, which is just blood. But for pneumothorax, um, this is a partial or total accumulation of air in the pleural space. So it's between the lung and the pleural cavity surrounding the lungs. So this is usually caused by trauma. Um, it can be caused, some people are just more predisposed to it, like tall, thin people. But um, if a lung pops, a lot of times that will cause air to get between the lung itself and the um, the, the pleural sac that the lungs stay in. It may also be caused by medical conditions, which is why it's called spontaneous pneumothorax. It just happens. There was not a trauma related to it. Um, this is a diagram just kind of showing you how it, how it might happen there's a vacuum like pressure in the pleural space that keeps the lungs inflated if something happens to cause the lung to either get injured be by trauma or something like that and that vacuum is lost the lungs going to collapse when the surface of the lung is disrupted air escapes into the pleural cavity and it can't get you can't get rid of it right so if it's outside the lung then normal exhaling is not going to allow you to breathe that out um so every breath you take the more for every breath you take, you're going to get more and more air into that side. Eventually, it's going to get to a point where it starts to push against the other lung. Um, and so you'll get some outward signs like tracheal deviation, which means that your your windpipe 
starts to shift to one side or the other. If you see that, that's a pretty late sign that they've got a lot of air in that lung cavity um, that should not be there. Usually, and it takes a paramedic to fix it because they're going to have to they're going to have to put a, a pin in the chest um, to do a needle decompression. And Wesley, I know you know how to do it. Uh, it's just out of our scope as EMTs. So spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in patients with certain lung infections um, or in young people born with weak areas of the lung. People with emphysema or asthma are at a higher risk, and tall, thin males, like I was saying, are at a higher risk. Pleural effusion. A pleural effusion is a collection of fluid outside the lung, so it's like a hemothorax, but it's just um, any kind of fluid that's still within that, that pleural sac. It compresses the lung and causes dyspnea, which makes it you know, hard to breathe. It can be caused by an irritation, infection like pneumonia, uh, congestive heart failure or cancer, and a lot of times because of gravity. Basically, patients will feel better when they sit upright. So if a patient lays down, they have a hard time breathing, and then they sit up, what's happening is, is that that fluid is getting, gravity is pulling it down to the bottom. It's below the, uh, it's below the lungs, so they have an easier time breathing. Obstruction of the airway. So somebody choked on a steak, um, kid swallowed a peppermint, which is what I was really bad about doing, choked on a couple Jolly Ranchers, that thing. Treat this quickly, um, get behind them, do the Heimlich maneuver, hopefully you can get it up. If they don't, or if they lose if they lose consciousness, you're gonna lower them to the ground and start doing CPR. The only difference being is that every time you go to open the airway and give your two breaths, look and see if you can see what they were choking on. If you can see it, you can sweep for it. If you don't see it, don't do a blind finger sweep. That's straight out of CPR. And at the EMT level, it's pretty much the same thing we teach. So um, in this picture, their tongue is occluding the airway. If this is what's obstructing, then, or on, I'm sorry, on the right, it's the tongue. On the left, it's a piece of steak or some kind of food. If the tongue is the problem, then we can use either an NPA or an OPA. If food is a problem, we're talking about Heimlich maneuver and eventually CPR, it just depends. Pulmonary embolism. This is an embolus, or I'm sorry, an embolus is anything in the circulatory system that moves from its point of origin to a distant site and lodges there, obstructing subsequent blood flow in that area. So again, think about your, we talked about this the other night. If I have a blood clot, all right, and let's say that it is in the veins. All right, so DVTs, deep vein thrombosis. Where am I going to have problems with that getting stuck at? Is it going to get stuck in a leg or an, or an arm or something, or is it going to get stuck in the lungs? If it's on the vein side. lung so if the vein if a, if a if the embolus is or the um or the clot is on the on the vein side that means that when it breaks loose it's going to go back to the heart and knowing how blood flows through the heart it's going to wind up getting stuck in the lungs if it's on the arterial side no now now you're going to be getting smaller and smaller vessels out in the body so you know it might you might be lucky it might just get stuck in a leg you might be unlucky and have it get stuck somewhere in the head and then they have a stroke. Um, that's just part of it. But an embolism is a blood clot that circulates through the venous system and gets stuck in the lungs. All right. That's what causes the pulmonary embolism. Circulation can get cut off partially or completely. It's just kind of like just like a um, an obstructed airway. Significantly decreases the blood flow, which makes it very hard for them to breathe. Um, and if it's bad enough, it can even cause sudden death. Signs and symptoms include dyspnea, right there at the top, right? Trouble breathing. Tachycardia, tachypnea, so they're going to breathe faster. Their heartbeat's going to pick up. Varying degrees of hypoxia really just depends on how big this thing is and where it gets stuck. Cyanosis, which is what? And I'm going to keep reading this um, while we go. Acute chest pain and hemo hematosis or hemoptysis, or whatever, however you want to say it. Um, what is cyanosis? Bluish tint to the skin, good. And is that an early sign or a late sign of hypoxia? Good. 
do you see cyanosis early or late? It's actually a late sign. If um if they're already blue around the lips, like like Donna was saying, mucous membranes, if they're blue around the lips and the fingertips and all that stuff, um, they've been hypoxic for a while. So that's we you know that's a very big easy telltale sign of hypoxia and we we always jump on cyanosis as being like the big sign that they're hypoxic but the problem is is that that's a late sign and so hopefully our goal is to fix things before they get to that point so if you walk in the room and they're already cyanotic well that's that's you know sucks but that's not your fault if um if you show up and they're just anxious but then by the time you get them to the hospital, they're cyanotic. That usually means that there was something that um, made the situation worse and they stayed hypoxic while you were there. That may or may not be your fault. It may be that it just was something you couldn't you couldn't control um, or it may have been that you overlooked something. Hyperventilation. This is where we just basically breathe too fast. So what's our normal breathing rate as adults? Twelve to twenty. Good. Um, there is a fudge factor to that. All right. If somebody's breathing twenty-four times a minute. They're not really technically considered to be um, tachypnic. Just like if they're breathing eight times a minute, they're not technically bradypnic. They're just outside of that that twelve to twenty range. If they're any more than that, then they're considered to be either brady or tacky. Um, so if they're tacky, or if they're hyperventilating, which is tachypnic then we run into a couple of issues. The big thing is that they're going to breathe off all their CO2, and that may or may not be the intent. Head injuries, um, a lot of times if they get hit in the head, the body will start to do that because it feels like it's getting acidic when it's really not. It's basically just a haywire system in the brain, and they're going to breathe off all their CO2. Um, it may be that they are acidic. Right. Maybe they're trying to fight some kind of acidosis. So they're going to pick up their breathing. Um, if you see them hyperventilating on their own, usually that's a problem. That doesn't happen unless they're just like unless they just ran a mile. But um, if that's the, actually why you were called or if it's a respiratory emergency and they're hyperventilating, um, that's usually a sign that there's something wrong. And that is normally a buildup of acid in the blood, which is acidosis. And that can be acute or it can be chronic. It just depends. If it's chronic, we call that um, um, metabolic. Metabolic acidosis just means it's long term. All right. Um, but if they are actually breathing off all of their CO2, they're losing that acidity. Then now they're going to start going way off in the alkalosis. So they're going to get a much higher pH, right? We said 7.4 was where we wanted to be. If they hyperventilate, they're going to start to climb that number in 7.5, 7.6, and it's just worse and worse because um, they're trying to fight acidosis. And again, it may, it, they may not be in it. It could be something causing them, their body to think they are. Maybe a receptor is messed up or they got hit in the head and a brain injury is causing the body to misread its, its CO2 levels and they're going to breathe it all off. Um, when, they're, when they get into this alkalosis, they can have symptoms of a panic attack. So the hyperventilation causes the hyperventilation causes the hyperventilation. It, just, it, they, it becomes a bad spiral. Um, but they're going to have some signs like anxiety, dizziness, numbness, tingling of the hands and feet, painful spasms in their hands and feet. Uh, the further out to your extremities you get when your CO2 gets off like that, the worse, that's where you're going to feel it. The decision whether hyperventilation is being caused by a life-threatening illness or a panic attack should not be made outside the hospital. It's not really our, it's not, that's not our place. Um, we treat them the same. So if they're hyperventilating, we try to get them to get their breathing down and then get them to a hospital. If it's just a panic attack, well, you can figure that out there. Um, the first thing we do is verbally instruct the patient to slow his or her breathing. If that doesn't work, give them some oxygen, transport them to the hospital. If they're breathing way too fast, you may have to bag them to slow them down, um, which has always sounded like it doesn't really work, but it, it actually does. Because the faster they're going to breathe, the, the more shallow they're breathing. So if you put a bag on them and you actually give them good deep breaths, you're going to 
create a, a situation where they don't have to breathe as fast because they're now they're taking deeper breaths again. All right, environmental or industrial exposure. Um, pesticides, cleaning solutions, chemicals, chlorine, and other gases can be accidentally released at industrial sites and inhaled by employees. Many industrial sites have their own medical fire or hazmat teams. I know you guys around, like, for example, the Mississippi coast, um, Ingalls, Chevron. If you're out in Texas, you have a lot of, you know, have a lot of stuff out there. Um, I don't know about Arkansas. Uh, Louisiana has a lot of industrial places around New Orleans. Um, is it, is it, what is it called? Port Sulphur out kind of close to Lake Charles. Y'all don't have anything really in, um, is that Arkansas? Port Sulphur. Thank you. I couldn't remember what the name of it was. Yeah, I because I've driven, I'll, I'll be driving east out of Texas and I'm surrounded on both sides of the road <laughs> by uh, industrial sites. I'm like, man, this is not where I want to be if something goes wrong. All right, carbon dioxide, or not dioxide, it's carbon, carbon monoxide. Um, this is kind of a silent killer. The only thing I really want to say about this is it's odorless. It's highly poisonous. It attaches to your hemoglobin and your blood, and it doesn't let go. It's only one oxygen molecule versus the two that we need. To breathe, we need O2, right? So two oxygen molecules. Carbon monoxide is only one. Um, but because it's smaller, imagine if your job all day was to carry weight around the body, carry these big, you know, doubled up O2 cells all around the body, and that was your life. 24 seven. But then one day you, you come along the pile to pick something up and you find this much smaller one, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to continue to pick up the big ones or we're going to grab the small one, make our life easier. And I'm going to start carrying this lighter weight. Um, that's what's happening when we breathe in carbon monoxide, the, the hemoglobin in the cell finds a lighter, smaller monoxide that O1 and it picks it up. The problem is it, cells don't want it. All right. So as it's trucking around in the body and it's like, hey, cell, I've got this lightweight monoxide, carbon monoxide. Do you want this? And all the cells are like, no, we don't. So you hold on to it. Um, that red blood cell just continues to circulate, it gets back to the lungs where it's going to try to pick up more oxygen. But the problem is it just got that carbon monoxide attached to it and now it becomes a problem that red blood cell can no longer grab o2 because it's got that carbon monoxide attached and it won't let it go um and so it just continues to circulate with something that the cells don't want that's kind of the issue um real quick i asked this in uh, fire prevention week the other day what is is carbon monoxide heavier than air or lighter than air How fast does CO2 clear out of a residence? I, well, our carbon monoxide just kind of depends. It depends on ventilation, um, the amount that's in there, all that stuff. Let me ask you this. Why do we, why, what makes you all think that it's heavier than air? It's kind of a trick question. This is why I brought it up. Um, carbon monoxide is actually a little bit lighter than air. It's very, very close. Maybe found with rising air. So if carbon monoxide is lighter than air, why do we put our carbon monoxide detectors around the baseboards? Or, or like typically they're low in a room. Well, you would think so, um, but actually carbon monoxide, and here's, here's the reason, carbon monoxide will disperse itself evenly across the space. Um, the heat may rise, but the carbon monoxide is not necessarily, the heat, heat and carbon monoxide are two very different things. Um, carbon monoxide is a byproduct that, uh, from that heat source, but it's not the heat itself. So the heat may rise, but the carbon monoxide will fill the room evenly. It'll be the same at the top as it is at the bottom, same in the corner as it is in the middle of the room. The reason that we put our, the, the only reason that we have carbon monoxide detectors kind of low in a room is because they have to plug in. 
and that's where our outlets are. Um, and it's okay because it disperses evenly across the room. It's not like smoke that rises to the top or um, you know, something that is truly denser than air and it settles at the bottom. It just spreads even. So whether you put your carbon monoxide detector on the ceiling or on the floor, it's going to be the same reading. So, but anyway, as a responder, um, just understand that there is no getting lower than the carbon monoxide, right? If you go into a house that's got it and you duck down or something like that, it's you're still breathing it in. Um, and it is cumulative. So if you go in for five minutes and then you come out, and you wait 20 minutes or whatever, and you go back in, you're not going back in at zero. You're going back in with whatever you came out at, and you're going to just continue to pick up more and more the longer you're in there. So be very, very careful. If you have to deal with something in a carbon monoxide rich environment, um, put on an air pack. A lot of ambulance companies, I will, I will say a lot of them, I don't know um, if AAA does or if any specific one does, but a lot of them will put on on the truck, one or two SCBA packs. Um, y'all have detectors? Okay, so if y'all, so basically, the rule is if you detect it, you just leave, I'm assuming. Have the fire department go in with their SCBA and pull them out. Yeah, because, I mean, the detector doesn't tell you anything other than, hey, you're in a bad environment, and that usually means get out. But, um, even if the ambulance doesn't have an SCBA, that's okay. So the detector is for the patient. Are you talking about the like? All right, so like their um, their pulse ox. You put it on their finger, and it tells you if they have CO, if they have carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm curious about that. So, um, pulse ox. I know I mentioned it before, and we'll talk about it again later. Your standard run of the mill pulse ox only looks at is there gas in the hemoglobin cells. We assume that that gas is oxygen, but we don't always know. So, if you get somebody in a bad environment, like a carbon monoxide environment, your standard pulse ox is going to tell you they might be rocking 100% O2. Really, they're rocking 100% gas and that could be 80 percent oxygen 20 percent carbon monoxide or you know 70 30 or whatever um but they do make some now they're they're not they're just a couple of years old they're um they're beefier versions of the pulse ox that actually determine what the gas is which is pretty cool the only problem is that they're expensive as hell so not a lot of people have them. um most people still use just a regular Regular pulse ox to give you a number, and then you take that number with a grain of salt, depending on what your patient is doing and where you found them, that kind of thing. All right, so let's talk about your patient assessment. Now we're going to talk about what, how do, how do you use your assessment in these situations? So somebody tell me, and you can unmute to do it, any one of you, and you can cheat. You can use your, your sheet, but somebody read off to me what is in your scene size up. I'm not going to call anybody out. Uh, how long does it stay in your body? So it just depends. Um, depends on how much you got. I don't think there's any definite science as to like if I'm out for 10 minutes, I lost this much. So that's a hard that's a hard question to answer. BSI seems safe. All right, what else? Number of patients. What else we got? There we go. MOI, NOI, hazards. There we go. All right. That's what I was looking for. So requesting different services. You guys hit all the rest of it. Um, the only thing I didn't see was additional resources. So perfect. All right. So in your scene size up, um, scene safety, BSI always comes first. Use your standard precautions. Consider the possibility of an infectious disease or toxic substance. Anytime somebody's having a hard time breathing, Try to rule out something that might make you have a hard time breathing if you enter the room. Okay, we just got done talking about carbon monoxide. So, you know, somebody, if it's a, you get a call out and everybody in the building is sick, 
um, oh, when it's, you know, the middle of January and they're all, their heaters are going and everything, that's usually, that's something you don't want to walk into. If it's an industrial plant and you smell something weird, um, that's probably a reason why you don't want to be there, that kind of thing. So try to, try to make sure that you can get safely to your patient first. Try to at least determine if why they're having that problem might hurt you. If they're a COPD patient or an emphysema patient, that's not necessarily anything that's going to hurt you. That's just their own issue. So you can go ahead and, and casually walk up to your patient. If there are multiple patients, multiple people, um, usually that's a big sign that there's an environmental issue going on. So for your mechanism of injury or your nature of illness, uh, if in question, ask them why they called 911. It's usually the easiest thing to do is just say, hey, you know, uh, no, you can't. Can't smell CO2, you can't smell carbon monoxide, but you can smell some toxic gases, what I was getting at. By questioning, like, for example, you can smell um, natural gas, right? Natural gas by itself has no smell, but we add something called mercaptan to it, which is what gives it that nasty smell. And you can, it's pretty... It's pretty pungent and it's very, very specific. Like when you smell it, you know, not smell natural gas, that kind of thing. But natural gas by itself doesn't have a smell either. Um, by questioning the patient, family, and or bystanders, you should be able to determine the nature of illness. Hopefully your patient's awake and can tell you, but um, that isn't always the case. For your primary assessment, you're gonna identify immediate life threats. So any problems with their ABCs, when they're having a respiratory issue, a lot of the time you're going to focus on exactly that, their airway and breathing. If they're alert, a lot of times their airway should be fine. Um, when you do your assessments for breathing, I want to point out that you're going to expose the chest and take a look to see if you see any issues that could infect, affect the lungs, um, even, especially for trauma. So we'll get into that more when we reach the trauma chapter. but. If they're having a hard time breathing and you're at this part and you don't, I mean, if, if they're sitting there tripoding and talking to you and everything, and um, I don't, I'm not saying you need to like take their shirt off or something like that. If they're alert, you can ask them like, is, did you hurt yourself? Did anything hit you in the chest? If they say no, then cool. But um, if they're unconscious or if you think there might be trauma, there's a couple of injuries I want to add to your checklist that you'll look for and you'll do this in your primary assessment so when you get to breathing look for a sucking chest wound um, which is a hole in the chest or a flail segment and we'll learn more about those when we get to those uh, trauma chapters but I want you guys to go ahead and get just get those words in your head um, and look for those so those are the injuries that could compromise the lungs be like broken ribs or you know they got stabbed or shot that kind of thing Note the age of your patient. Is the patient calm or anxious? Again, if they're anxious, that's a big sign that they're having a um, hypoxic episode for whatever reason, and that's usually one of the first signs. So if you can react at that point, a lot of times you can stop a bad situation before it ever becomes a real issue. Use AVPU at this point. We're not so concerned about their GCS. You just want to know, you know, are they alert? Are they nodding off and, and only responding to verbal? Are they really nodding off and they're only responding to pain or are they just flat out unconscious in front of you? If you can, ask the patient about his or her chief complaint. That's their, that's what's bothering them in their own words. All right, make sure your airway is patent and adequate. If they're up talking to you, then that is that is sufficient. If they're unconscious, then we're gonna go the NPA, OPA route, depending on what they can take. Once you've got their airway established, you're gonna assess their breathing. So we need to know not just their rate, which is 12 to 20 is what we're looking for, but you wanna get their rate, rhythm, so it should be even, and quality, which is um, equal rise and fall of the chest. You know, is it, is it a deep breath? Is it shallow? Are they breathing slow and shallow, which is a problem? Um, that kind of thing. We wanna make sure that they're breathing adequately. Ask the following questions, is the air in, in yourself? Is the air going in? Is the air coming out? That's what matters, right? And it's got to be some decent, decent amounts. Are you seeing chest rise? Um, is it equal? Is one side rising and the other one not? And is the rate adequate for the victim's age? Again, 12 to 20 for adults, but the smaller we are as we start getting into kids' ages and sizes, the breathing rates are higher. 
assess your breath sounds. So these are all the locations that you can check. And depending on what you're dealing with, you may want to check lower in their lobes. A lot of times just checking the four on the front is fine. But if they're if you notice anything or if they're if it sounds like they have some fluid in the lungs or something like that, um, check the other ones as well. So nine times out of ten, you may only do the four breath sounds on the front. If you can't hear anything, you can check on the back. Um, and there's other locations too. Like you can check on their side under the armpit. Sometimes you you'll hear something there. Um that lets you know whether or not they have good you want to hear like clean air movement. You don't want to hear a, uh, a gurgling sound like there's water in the lungs. You don't want to hear wheezing, but that's what you're checking for. For the circulation, evaluate for shock and bleeding. Um, the cap refill is kind of BS. I don't like the two minute drill for or two second drill for cap refill. There's just too many things that mess it up. But what it is good for is trending. Um, squeeze their fingertips, see how long it takes for their blood for the, the fingernail to turn back pink. Um, if it's more than two seconds, that's okay. If it's, if it's five to six seconds, that's a problem. Like that's a long time, right? But if it's, holy crap, it was, it was three seconds. That's don't, don't worry about that. That's okay. Where it becomes important is if you, you squeeze it once and it's three seconds and you go back five minutes later and you squeeze it again. And now it's five or six. That's a problem. All right. Cause now you're seeing it get worse or, you know, it, even better, if you squeeze it once and it's four seconds, you go back five seconds, five minutes later, and you squeeze again, it's two seconds. Congratulations, you have helped your patient. Um, but you're going to check their pulse, check their circulation, and reassess life threats. Make sure there's no hemorrhaging or anything of that sort that you've got to take care of. Make your transport decision. The biggest thing I want to say here is if you have to fix anything in their primary, they are a high priority for transport. Everything you do in the class will be a high priority for transport. Very few things you do in the field will be a high priority for transport. It's just people call 911 for various reasons. Um, not to say you won't get a lot of those, but um, sometimes it's a toss up. You may go for days with low priority patients, and then you may go for days or weeks where everybody's having a damn heart attack, and you know, that's just the way it's going. Um, you never can tell in this field. All right, for your history taking, investigate the patient's chief complaint. If they're up and able to talk to you, um, focus your assessment on what they're having the problem with. Report pertinent negatives. Anybody give me an example of a pertinent negative? Uh, vomiting with no nausea or vomit. Yeah, that's my go-to as an example is, you know, usually nausea and vomiting together. But if you have a patient that's sitting there and then just mid sentence, they just blurt vomit across the room with no warning because they had no nausea, that's a pertinent negative, right? Um, usually that's a sign that there's something else wrong. And that particular one is usually a head injury. But um, that's, a, that's a good example of a pertinent negative where something should be there, but it's not. Find out what the patient has done for the breathing problem, if they've already taken a medication in particular. Um, if anything is helping, again, you know, you go through your OPQRST, what makes it better or worse, that's where this falls in. And then get your sample history. Um, somebody tell me, see who can rattle it off the fastest, what's sample stand for? Science, what's A? Okay, good. Allergies, keep going. Medications, all right. Meds, good. And meds is a loaded question. There, there's a lot that you can get out of meds. It's not just what are you taking. Um, all right, keep going. What's P? Ooh, we're tripping people up. It's not pain. Nope, not provocation. Past medical history, Sharon got it. Pain and uh, well, pain is what your there is no letter for pain for one thing, but provocation is in your OPQRST. P and sample is your pertinent medical history. It's any medical history that it, that actually pertains to why they called nine one one. 
It doesn't matter if they broke their ankle when they were six years old. That's unless, you know, that's where the problem's at. All right. Somebody already put up last oral intake for L. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. What is um E? Events leading to the problem. Good job. Yep. Megan got it. I just wanted to see other people name it. So excellent. All right. Same thing with OPQRST, same thing with your, your assessment. I want you guys to be able to rattle these things off pretty much in one breath. So signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, events leading up to, boom, there it is. Just like that. All right. Um, I will keep harping on those as we go through the class. So hopefully by the time we get to the boot camp, that part of the learning is done and we just start applying it to the scenarios and everything. Bootcamp is going to be fun. That's where you take all this death by PowerPoint, boring and start, you know, listening to me drone for hours and you actually get to start doing stuff with your hands. Um, it makes it, it, that's where the fun starts. It's still learning. Nobody's going to be, you know, jumping down your throat or anything like that. You just get to practice doing it. Um, OPQRST. This is what we use when we're trying to determine how something feels. All right. So I usually call this the pain assessment because that's usually where I'm trying to figure out what when somebody says their stomach hurts. This is the thing that I go to first because I want to know what am I looking at? Onset, provocation, quality, radiation, um, or region, the severity, which is your pain scale, and then T is time. So like how long has it been going on? All right, for paste, this is not something that I typically use, but I'm going to go over it anyway just because it's on the slide. Progression, like has it gotten worse? Um, associated chest pain, does it hurt when you take a breath? Sputum, are they, are they, like if they have a cough, is it a productive cough? Is there something coming out or is it a dry cough? Talking tiredness is basically, does it start to sound like they're starting to drift, like drift off, like they're, they're getting sleepier and sleepier? And then exercise tolerance. Um, basically, can they handle breathing heavier from exercise? Um, if they do anything, if they exert themselves in any way, does it cause them to, to really get more respiratory problems or not? Uh, the boot camp is going to be, the dates are going to depend on where you're at. Most of the boot camps, the, like at Abita Springs, Pascagoula area, those are going to happen on the 11th through the 15th of January. Um, other locations are going to be probably the, like the next week, just so that I can make sure I can get to everybody. Because I don't want to, I don't want to not be at one of your boot camps. All right, continuing on, your secondary assessment. Secondary assessment is a more in-depth assessment of the body systems. Only proceed with secondary assessment if the life threats have been taken care of. If you still have something going on in the primary, don't move on to the secondary until it's been fixed or at least uh, mitigated. Keep an open mind, gather as complete a history as possible, and perform a secondary assessment of uh, any body systems that they may be having a problem with, respiratory, cardiovascular. Um, look at their skin, get a good blood pressure, and check their neuros. Use any monitoring devices that you've got, so like a, a pulse ox or whatever. Get a good um, set of vitals at this point. Secondary assessment of COPD versus congestive heart failure. Uh, so look for signs of COPD. There we go. If they have it, um, some things that are kind of a, either like a risk factor for COPD or something you're going to normally find. Patients older than 50 um, often have a history of lung problems or almost always long-term active or former cigarette smokers. Like my dad didn't live long enough to see these problems, but the, he, he was a three-pack-a-day kind of guy. Um, if he were still alive, he would definitely be fighting with this stuff by now. Complaining of tightness in the chest and constant fatigue. Chest may have a barrel-like appearance like we were talking about earlier, often using accessory muscles to breathe and exhibit abnormal breath sounds. All right, and then your reassessment. Um, basically, this is where you're going to go back, double check to make sure nothing went wrong in your primary or your secondary. If they are unstable, or critical patients, they're going to be reassessed every five minutes. If they are stable patients, 
um, which almost no respiratory issue will ever be stable because that's a that's a primary assessment issue. But that would be 15 minutes. All right, emergency medical care, management of respiratory distress. If a patient complains of difficulty breathing, you should administer supplemental oxygen immediately, um, even if they're a COPD patient. All right, if they're having trouble breathing, give them oxygen. Now, how much oxygen you give could change. All right, if they're known COPD, start small, get a number, figure out where their um, where their percentage is at, and then titrate it from there. Now, real quick, what's the normal percentage um, range that we want people to be in for their O2 sats? 94 to 99. 94 to 99. 96 is good. That's that's in the range, but we want to be pretty much just upper 90s. We don't want to be 100%. All right. If you you check their O2 sat and they're rocking at 100, um, dial back the oxygen a little bit. Try to keep them in the 90s, the upper 90s. Some patients may need CPAP or a BVM. Those two are that's an that's an either or. All right. If they're alert and you've got it, you can use a CPAP. Um, the minute they start to have an altered level of consciousness, though, the CPAP has to come off and switch to a BVM. Patient may have an MDI, which is a metered dose inhaler, um, or a small volume nebulizer, especially if they have a chronic issue like asthma and they've already been diagnosed. Consult med control and make sure medication is indicated. As EMTs, um, we do still need to kind of contact med control just to get that oversight, but usually they're not going to they're not going to knock you. Um, or tell you, unless there's some reason, that your asthma patient doesn't need an inhaler if they're having a problem. All right, contraindications. Um, so patients unable to coordinate inhalation, inhaler is not prescribed, right? And this is, and if it's not prescribed, that's all right, call med control. They may tell you to use something else. Permission not obtained from med control. There you go, it's the next step. Not permissible by local protocol, which falls on the med control statement. That's kind of the same thing. Maximum prescribed dose is already reached. Um, medication is expired. So if your five rights or six rights are not all there, um, then you can't use it. And there are other contraindications specific to the medication. Most respiratory inhalation medications are used to relax the muscles that surround the air passages in the lungs, leading to dilation of the airways. The um, another issue for this would be nitro, or not issue, but another medication that does this is nitro. Um, that's a cardiac med, so don't don't try to use that for somebody, but just know that like the effects of that are going to be the same. It's a smooth muscle relaxer. Some common side effects of inhalers include increased pulse rate, nervousness, and muscle tremors. So if you if you help somebody with an inhaler and they see that or you see that as a as a an outcome that's okay that's that just sometimes happens all right um i know it's not quite seven o'clock yet or i'm sorry not quite eight o'clock yet so we're going to go ahead and take a break anyway be back at five minutes after and we're going to get into the treatment of special conditions this is pretty much how it all ends for the night um but I don't want to I don't want to give a break right in the middle of it. So be back five after uh, we are very close to being done.
right, guys, we're going to get back on it. Um, I know it's not hadn't quite been 10 minutes yet, but we're pretty close. And we're getting close to the end of the, of the lecture, so we'll go ahead and truck on. But let's talk about treatment for specific conditions, right? The different things that we've talked about tonight, here's what you're going to do for them. And this is what I want you to focus on whenever you, you come across these. Don't know your assessments absolutely, like I said. But I want you to think, as soon as you find out you're dealing with a COPD patient, I want this to be the stuff that runs through your head. It's what am I going to do for my patient? Because that's what matters. The assessment is a tool to help you, A, keep yourself safe, right? B, make sure there's you check everything that needs to be checked, but it ultimately is there as a tool for you to know what treatments you can give, when can you give them, when might there be a reason why you can't give it, that kind of thing. Um, so we'll start with the airway infections, upper and lower. If you can, administer humidified oxygen. Now, a lot of your ambulance companies will have um, the little water bottles that attach to their oxygen line so that you can do that. Don't attempt to suction the airway or place an OPA um, in a patient with suspected epiglottitis. All right, it can just make the matter worse. If you have to set an airway for somebody with that, go ahead and use the NPA. It doesn't quite go as deep. It's not as good of an airway, but it works. Position them comfortably and transport promptly. Pretty much O2, try not to put a hard airway OPA in there just because you make it inflames it and then if it swells up even more, now you've got a an obstruction in the airway that is not something you can get out, right? We don't you can't remove somebody's epiglottis. Um, so stick to the soft things like the NPA. It really just doesn't do as much damage. For your acute pulmonary edemas, same thing. You're going to provide 100% oxygen suction if necessary, so you're maintaining their airway position comfortably. And an unconscious patient may require full ventilatory support, including placement of an airway adjunct. You can use um, OPAs on this is perfectly fine. Provide CPAP if indicated, which usually is, are they awake? They have to be awake to control their airway when you put a CPAP on them. Transport them promptly. For COPD, assist with a prescribed inhaler if they have it. Watch for side effects that are due to overuse. Position them comfortably, transport promptly. Give them oxygen if you need to. Um, that usually is going to be something in all of these. Asthma. Determine if asthma is really the problem. All right, it could just be a symptom or a side effect of something bigger. Be prepared to suction. Assist the asthma patient with a prescribed inhaler. And again, that is assuming that they can take the breath. All right, if they're completely shut off, um, check your protocols. But usually, you guys can give like an EpiPen or some kind of some kind of hit of Epi to open the airway, just even if it's just long enough to get an albuterol treatment in there. Provide aggressive airway management, which is what that would be, oxygen and prompt transport. A prolonged asthma attack that is unrelieved may progress into a condition known as status asthmaticus, which basically just means that it's not going away. Um, this is a real emergency. People live with asthma. It's no big deal. But if they develop this, this is kind of a life or death. This is not even kind of. This is really a life or death situation. And it should be pedaled to the floor and get them to the hospital as quickly as you can. Hay fever is unlikely to need emergency treatment. Um, usually this is just a sinus infection. It's not that big of a deal, but if it gets pretty bad, then you gotta treat it effect, um, accordingly. So just manage their airway, give oxygen according to their level of distress, and then take them to the hospital if they wanna go. Anaphylaxis, um, this is shock. We were talking a little bit earlier tonight about shock and like the different you know, when we would talk about it, this is one form of it. We're going to really harp on this when we get to allergic reactions. But you're going to treat this the same way. All right. Remove the offending agent. Maintain the airway. Transport rapidly. Administer Epi if you can. Um, because, again, this is like your EpiPen. That's what this is for. If you can give it, give it. It opens the airway back up. Spontaneous pneumothorax. Provide supplemental oxygen. As always, transport promptly and monitor carefully. There's really not a lot you can do. If they develop a pneumo, the, the real fix to this is at the paramedic level, um, and it's a needle decompression. We can't do those as basics, so don't waste time on the scene. In fact, if you have a patient with this, I would consider, if you don't already have a paramedic on the truck, 
I would consider having one meet you in route just in case, because every breath they take, like I said, is going to make it worse. And um, you don't want to you don't want to get into that situation where they need a decompression and you can't do it. Um, even if a paramedic hits them with the needle, it's not like you see in movies where they just oh I can breathe. It's, it doesn't happen that fast. Those needles are big, but they're not that big. Um, there may be times where they just need more than one needle. Like a paramedic can drop needles all over the place trying to, to alleviate that pressure, and it still takes a long time for them to decompress. So um, the sooner you can get them on scene to start that, if it need, if need be, the better. Pleural effusion, fluid removal must be done in the hospital. We can't do that in the field. Even the paramedics can't. Not only that, we really don't want to. That's That's a pucker factor that we don't want to deal with. Provide oxygen and transport promptly. Obstruction of the airway. Um, partial obstructions, usually you can just kind of let them try to cough it up, give them some oxygen and transport. If it's a complete obstruction, clear the obstruction as best you can, give oxygen. And if you can't get it to clear out, then take them to the hospital. If they go unconscious, um, resort to CPR. Pulmonary embolism. Supplemental oxygen is mandatory for these. All right, this pulmonary embolisms can be like deadly, sudden death kind of deadly. So they will get oxygen. They will get it very quickly and in large amounts. Position them comfortably. Um, if hemoptysis is present, clear the airway immediately. So you can suction them if you need to, um, whatever you got to do. Hyperventilation. Complete primary assessment and gather history. That's pretty much, you want to try to figure out why are they hyperventilating. We don't diagnose, but there's there's specific reasons why somebody might get into this. And if you can figure out what it is, um, you might be able to get them to stop doing it. The paper bag trick, we don't do that in the field. Uh, it really doesn't do anything. It's It's a fancy idea to have them rebreathe their CO2, but think about it, you know, same thing that we have, same reason why you can do mouth to mouth and give somebody O2 um, is the reason why the bag trick really doesn't work. When they breathe out, they're filling the bag mostly with clean air that was in their dead space. Um, so the next breath is not going to really do anything for their carbon dioxide levels. Plus, you actually are somewhat suffocating your patient when you do that. So don't don't do the paper bag trick. Reassure the patient, try to calm them down, provide some oxygen. You can bag them if it's really bad. Um, and then, of course, transport. Environmental or industrial exposure. Ensure the patients are decontaminated. If you can't completely decontaminate them or if you think that there is still a, a threat of it, then when you transport, make sure the receiving hospital understands that they need to take precautions as well. Um, so that you're not just carrying an, an infected patient or, or like some kind of toxic um, source into the hospital. Treat with oxygen, use adjuncts if needed to maintain the airway and suction based on presentation. So if he's got fluid or um, a lot of mucus coming up in his airway, suction all that stuff out. Foreign body aspiration, um, perform the appropriate airway clearing technique specific to the age. So, it's pretty much all the same. If you can see it, sweep, fart, grab it, whatever. Um, provide oxygen and transport. Tracheostomy dysfunction. Your main goal is to establish a patent airway. Usually if a tracheostomy fails, it's because you got clogged. So suction it, um, try to clear it out, and then provide oxygen. And remember, if they're using a tracheostomy, that's where they're breathing from. So the mouth and nose is not, that's not where we're going to put our, um, our O2 sat, or not O2 sat, but our oxygen source and all that stuff. Um, once the obstruction is clear, give them oxygen. Asthma. So we kind of talked about this a little bit already. For kids, use blow by oxygen by holding the mask in front of the child's face. They really don't like having those masks on their face. Um, I don't know if it's claustrophobia or if it's just... I don't know. They don't like it, um, and they'll fight you. They'll they'll try to take it off or whatever. So it's easier if you just hold it in front of them and let the air just kind of blow onto them. Use inhalers as you would with older patients. So as EMTs, we don't 
just shove the thing on their in their mouth, right? Uh, we let them do it. Something with kids too. Um, if you're dealing with a, a child asthmatic and they have an inhaler, see if they have a spacer as well. It really helps. A lot of times kids aren't very good with dealing with the inhaler by itself, so they'll put a spacer on it. If they have one, use it. It makes it much easier for them. Cystic fibrosis. Um, this is a genetic disorder that affects the lungs and digestive system. It predisposes children to repeat lung infections. They're just going to get it all the time. So symptoms range from anything from just sinus congestion to wheezing and asthma-like complaints. Um, usually the parents or caregivers will call EMS based on the child having a hard time breathing. So suction is needed to keep the airway clear and oxygenate, take them to the hospital. That's it. The only other thing I want to talk about, we didn't really um, talk about how to use an inhaler and we're going to do that at the boot camp. So it's not, that's why we really didn't harp on it too much, but there's a couple of things I just want you guys to know. If you help somebody with an inhaler, basically when you squeeze that medicine down and they inhale, make sure they know to hold the pain, hold the um, the medication in for 10 seconds before they before they exhale. That way it's got time to really get into their um, their bronchioles and cause that relaxation. But other than that, that's it. Is there any questions on what we covered tonight? Um, I know from the Facebook group, you guys are saying like some of this is kind of getting to be information overload and I get it. There is a lot um, of information in EMT school. It does get much worse when you go to paramedic, but um, it's, if it doesn't make sense as far as like, if you're thinking about how am I going to apply this in the real world, that's where the fun of the boot camp comes in. So don't let it be a, um, a downer or anything like that. You guys are doing fantastic on your tests. You're showing that you are retaining the information. Some of you have 95s, 97s. Um, I think the top grade in the class right now is a 97. I have to go back and look. But I mean, a lot of y'all are, you're up there and you're, you're rocking it. So don't worry so much about the hands-on portion. That's where the boot camp comes in right now. I want you to keep focusing on the cognitive stuff. Um, think about it from a registry written point of view. This is where we're learning the stuff that's going to help you get past that written test, which is a beast. No matter how good you are, it's going to suck. Um, the hands-on skills and everything—that's that's the boot camp. So if you're a if you're a tactile learner where you work, you learn by your hands. I know this part sucks, but you're going to get a lot of light bulbs um, when you get to the boot camp. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a pain. Um, that test is hard no matter how good you are because it if you get a question right, your next one's harder. You get that question right, your next one's harder. It will find your limit um, no matter how good you are. So just be aware of that. The written test is the reg – yes. So when I, when I talk about the registry, I'm talking about the written test. The skills are not technically registry. The skills, they're part of it, but they're not the written test. Um, you'll have all that stuff done. The last thing you'll do is the written national registry exam. The practical can be, but by the time you get to the end of the boot camp, you guys are going to be fine. Uh, you actually get more hands-on time in, a, in the class format like this than you do if you're in a traditional class. And it's just five days of just skill, 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 skill. It's hands-on all day. The last half of the week is all scenarios. So by the time we get to the end of the boot camp, your, your practical at the end um, is just another scenario. You're going to be like, all right, I got this. Whatever. All right, hey, your, so your pen for the night is going to be B is in Bravo, C is in Charlie, um, one five R is in respiratory. So B C one five R. There you go. It's in the text as well. Do I recommend one of the past the registry exam helpers? I'll be honest with you. Um, the master your medics stuff is very very good. If you want to just do some exam, some registry style questions, they have apps out there you can use. They're free. I wouldn't, I would say absolutely use them, but I wouldn't pay for them. There's plenty of free options in there. Um, some of them, like I use, I use the test prep sometimes that for different things like nursing or whatever, and you can pay to get more questions, but it's not really that necessary. Um, look on your app store, whatever kind of phone you got. And you have a pretest that are just like the written. Yeah. No, I don't be nervous, man. By the time we get to the registry, you're going to have this. So 
I mean, you guys, like I said, y'all are doing good. You're rocking the test. Now, granted, um, the registry is going to be a lot harder than some of the tests you're taking, but um, it's only because of how they word the questions. They'll give you a paragraph that is just, it's like 90% distractors. And um, the question may not have anything to do with vital signs, even though they gave you a full set of vitals. The question, you know, so I will say that when you take the registry, let each question be the first question that you that you look at. Don't let the last question mess you up for the, the question you're on. Don't let that question mess you up for the next one. Um, and figure out what it's asking you. Because like I said, if it gives you a, a page full of text, um, most of that stuff is probably not at all necessary for you to answer the question. If you can figure out what the question actually wants you to answer, it makes finding that answer a lot easier because a lot of your, you may look at the, the options and it'll say, you know, well, this, this one looks right. It's right because of the vitals, but if the vitals aren't, aren't pertaining to the question, then that one doesn't really matter. Um, but you guys will be fine. Like I said, y'all are rocking it right now. Just keep on keeping on, keep doing what you're doing. Is there any questions before we call it a night? <laughs> I had to take the HESI before I took the uh, registry for paramedics. So by the time I got to the paramedic registry, it was no big deal. Easy peasy. Um, the HESI is much worse than the registry. So, all right. If there's nothing else, y'all have a good night. I'll talk to you on Thursday when we hit the next chapter. Keep up the good work.